Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, when we started Excess Returns, we stayed away from having a standard closing question for our guests because we couldn't come up with one that summed up the knowledge of our guests into something simple that your average investor could understand. But a little over a year ago, we came up with a question that we thought worked perfectly. If our goal was to help investors learn along with us, then it made sense to ask our guests the most important lesson they had learned themselves. So we finally settled in on our standard closing question, which is based on your experience in the markets, if you could teach one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? Since we started asking the question, we received some amazing answers and we thought it'd be interesting to take a look at some of the best ones. Here are the top 10 lessons our guests would teach your average investor. Our first lesson comes from an interview with Research Affiliates founder, Rob Arnott. Many of us have a tendency to chase expensive stocks and lack discipline. Rob reminds us why that can be a major problem. The mistake 99% of investors make with some regularity is buy high and sell low. Uh, whatever is newly expensive got there by creating great joy and profit. People don't want to sell. Whatever is newly cheap got there by inflicting pain and losses. People don't want to buy. But if you can impose on yourself a discipline of rebalancing, a discipline of saying, this asset has been so successful, has been wonderful. Is it out of line with the underlying fundamentals? Should I cut back? Um, for growth strategies, always have an exit strategy. If you don't have an exit strategy, you're going to ride the full cycle and you're going to get hurt. For value strategies, always have an entrance rule, a reason to buy. And our entrance rule is very simple. If something is cheap relative to its fundamentals and it's no longer in free fall, it's okay to start buying. And you nibble away, you nibble away, and that way you wind up with peak exposure at the trough. All of us as investors have a tendency to think we can forecast the future, but in reality, we are probably better off relying on the past to understand the likelihood that certain future events will occur. Michael Lobison, author of Expectations Investing and head of Conciliate Research at Morgan Stanley's Counterpoint Global, made this point when we asked him, for his most important lesson? So Justin, it's a great question. And I think that I would encourage people to learn about and apply base rates as they think about the world of investing. By the way, it's not just valuable for investing, but really business or your life, actually, it's good for your life. And again, a base rate, uh, you know, the, 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 the basic setup is the natural way to think about the world or solve your problems is to gather a bunch of information and combine it with your own ex inputs and experience and project into the future. And that's, that's what we all do left to our own devices. Using base rate says, I'm going to think about what I'm facing now or my problem as an instance of a larger reference class. I'm going to basically ask what happened when other people or organizations were in this position before. And it's a very unnatural way to think because you have to leave aside, you know, sort of your own information gathering and your own experience. We all tend to place a lot of value on that. And you have to find and appeal to the base rate, which may not be at your fingertips and often it's not. So you have to go out and make a little effort to find it. But once you do, I think it reshapes how you think a lot about the world. And I think uh, makes you more grounded in terms of how you think about how things are likely to unfold. So to me, if that would be the one idea is to say, let's think about base rates. You know, you mentioned before, jokingly, that we're in that sort of season where people do forecasts. You know, that's a great example where base rates would be very helpful. And you, you sort of made the joke 10% with some standard deviation, but that's actually the right way to think about it. That's that's actually the right answer. And that was that's informed by uh, by base rates. So you're, you're, you got to the right place and the right way to think about it using that actual technique. So to me, that would be the one bit of advice I would give. And if I could go back to my 20 year old self, that's certainly what I would teach. And, and by the way, I would just say that it's remarkable how underutilized this concept is notwithstanding its demonstrable power, right? So anyway, that would be my, that would be my concluding thought. Sometimes it is easy to get locked into a certain opinion or a certain school of thought, but in investing, that could be a very dangerous thing. Cullen Roach of Discipline Funds and the popular Pragmatic Capitalism blog explains why. I, you know, the older I get, I feel like the, 
the more I realize, the less I know about all of this stuff. And so it's this weird sort of journey in finance and economics where, you know, you typically think that like the, the old guys are the ones that know everything. And I, the more I, I find myself becoming an old guy, the more I just sort of realized how little I know about all this stuff because it's so friggin' complex. And so, you know, I would say that one of the mistakes I made when I was younger was just pigeonholing myself, whether it be inside of like certain you know, political clicks or whether it's, um, even like certain strategies where you can find yourself in a attracted to like a very specific niche type of strategy. And what you'll find is that you could go through really long periods of time where that strategy doesn't perform well at all. And so to me being super open-minded, not only on the, the political side, but on the economic and finance side, and especially on the investing side is really important just because. You, you have to be positioned in a way so that you can kind of navigate all environments. And that's, I think to a large degree, it's, it's why I've become very attracted to like all weather portfolios, because I kind of know that I don't know what's going to happen in the future. And I want to, to a certain degree, at least with a big chunk of my assets, I want to diversify so much that I've always got components of my portfolio that are weathering any type of environment. So. Yeah, being being open minded to me is like a superpower in finance and economics. Whenever we try to gain an edge in investing, it's important to understand why that edge might be sustainable. And for that to be true, if we're going to win, someone else has to lose. And there has to be a reason why they are willing to do that. Ben Inker of GMO talked to us about the importance of understanding this idea. I, I wish it was a really simple thing. I think it's a simple idea, but it requires more work than I would love. Uh, but that is Whenever you're investing in something, make sure you understand why you should get paid for owning this asset, for performing this activity. Understand why it not only makes sense for you as the investor, but whoever is going to be funding that investment on the other side. Um, why it makes sense for them to be giving you the return. I would say there's, you know, there, there's a lot of errors people can make as investors. But one of the crucial ones that people make time and time again is forgetting about the fact uh, that if you're going to sustainably get a return, it needs to make sense to give you that return in terms of the person on the other side. And where you can't answer that question with, um, you're not investing, you're speculating. So I would say, you know, for the retail investors who are buying, you know, one week call options on AMC, the reality is you're not investing. The person on the other side has no reason to want to give you a high return, right? The person on the other side for one thing is a market maker and the market maker is the casino. The casino is only there to try to make money off of your activity. But the simple truth is whenever you're buying a call option, you're not doing anything useful. You only get the upside. And if you only get the upside, the person on the other side only gets the downside. There's no reason for them to want to give you a, a good return in the long run. So I think investors could avoid a lot of errors if they thought not just about, ooh, does this make sense for me? But does this make sense for me and the guy on the other side? If it doesn't make sense for the guy on the other side, this is not going to be a sustainable strategy in the long run. In recent years, many of us have known people who have made huge sums of money investing in risky assets, whether it be Bitcoin, meme stocks, or other risky investments. When we see those kinds of profits, it can make investing seem easy and make us seek out more short-term risk. But Robert Hagstrom, author of The Warren Buffett Way and other books, reminded us when he came on the podcast that these types of situations are the expectation rather than the rule and about the importance of patience in investing. Um, patience. And, and I know that's the overused word in the value investing. I don't know why it is that we think we have to make constant decisions every hour, every day, every week, every month, every quarter. Like, you know, the markets are not going to pass you by. Wealth is not going to pass you by. If you're patient in making your decision and the decision has been made by all of its constructs, when all that comes together and it's time to pull the trigger on an investment, you never look over your shoulder wondering had you made the right decision or the wrong decision. Because if you have that little bit of doubt, self-doubt, you're never comfortable with the position. You end up selling too soon 
and you're not able to compound it over time. Warren has made tremendous amounts of wealth by patiently investing in good opportunity. This rut to make as much money as fast as possible in the shortest period of time, I'm not sure that that's uh, the right recipe for compounding wealth over time. So patient decision making. Just take your time. Although it is easy in theory to talk about patience, it can be more difficult in practice. We spoke with behavioral investing expert Joe Wiggins, who gave us some sound practical advice. Stop checking your portfolio so often. Yeah, so this is going to come as no surprise here. Um, if you listen to the full conversation, and that's uh, I just try and check your portfolio less frequently. This is really hard for professional investors to do for obvious reasons. Um, provide pro prov private investors it is certainly possible. So I think if you want to control your behavior, one of the crucial ways of doing it is to interact with your portfolio less frequently. So make sensible long-term investment decisions and stick with them. Um, it's my, it's a key motto. I think for most investors, it doesn't mean you never touch them, but if you're uh, prudent uh, and moderate in how you interact with your investments, then you're far more likely to make good decisions and fewer decisions through time. Um, if you interact with it too frequently, you're increasing the risk of making behavioral mistakes, which will just compound, um, significantly and negatively through time. So check your portfolio less frequently after making sensible decisions at the start. You might not think goldfish and elephants can teach us anything about investing, but State Street's Matt Bartolini showed us that isn't the case. Here's Matt talking about what we can learn from both of them. Uh, I would say be part goldfish and part elephant. So goldfish have an incredibly short memory. Uh, elephants have an incredibly long memory. Uh, research has shown that you, uh, elephants can actually recognize enemies and friends over a long time frame. So when the market falls by 4% on a single day, be like a goldfish, kind of look past it and just forget it because typically what we found, and again, it, the stack could be off by one or two days, but yeah, you know, when the market has its 10 worst days, it's typically followed by its 10 best days. Then sort of be like an elephant, understand that over a long time frame, there's certain premiums in the market that has been rewarded. Diversification has a long history of being beneficial to overall portfolios. So definitely take that long view, have that long memory and what has historically worked. So I don't just sort of think about it, you know, be part goldfish, be part elephant. We all tend to look back at our investing decisions in hindsight and judge them based on the outcome. But often the thought process we went through is more important than evaluating the quality. Tobias Carlisle of the Acquirers Funds talks about a practical way to do that. I think you need to write down what you're doing at the time that you do it, because it takes, if you're a fundamental investor, it takes years really to work out whether the decision that you made actually resulted in the outcome that you thought. And the only way that you learn is by looking at outcomes against decisions. And it's so easy to forget why you did something. And really the worst case scenario, as funny, as funny as this sounds, but the worst case scenario is when you get some, the stock goes up, but for a reason that you didn't identify, so you got lucky. But then you, you start conflating that luck with some skill. And I think that you need to be intellectually honest with why you did something and you need to recognize those things. You need to recognize the ones that won, but you were wrong. Recognize the ones where you lost money, but you were right. And you need to try to work more towards the process and getting that right than relying on the outcome and deciding that you were right. So that's, that's my advice. It's, I've always said this, write it down. Because, you know, I've got stuff now that I wrote down in 2008. I can go back and look at it and I think that's garbage, but I, at least it's there and it's written down and I can see that there's been some evolution over the last, whatever it is, 13 or 14 years. One of the things we often talk about as quants is the importance of having a self-discipline. But one of the things we have enjoyed about the podcast is talking to people who have been successful doing things differently than we do. One of our favorite examples is David Gardner, co-founder of The Motley Fool. David turned our idea of a self-discipline on its head with his answer to our closing question. Uh, I would say, try never to sell. Um, you know, we had a lot of fun with sell discipline earlier. I think too much is made of it. Um, I think, I think you have to think about selling a lot. If you're not buying good stuff in the first place, like maybe you were buying it for a trade. You thought maybe we're in a cycle and you'll sell at the end of the cycle. You're trying to time the market. And so, so many reasons that people sell are because the thing they bought in the first place, they didn't buy something excellent where they didn't buy something that would persist. But those are the two things that I'm always trying to do is I'm trying to buy things that are excellent as early as possible 
and I'm going to let that persist for better and for worse. And so I really don't have to think about selling too much. So the less you think about selling, the more you're thinking about the quality of what you're buying. Buffett has a great line. I'm paraphrasing here. Something like, imagine if you had a ticket, you could only punch 20 times in your life and they're the 20 buys you can make and you can never sell. And if you take something like that as your mentality, I believe that you will do better with all of your investing than if you did it. So I love the wisdom of don't sell, try never to sell. That's been what I've demonstrated. Like all of the stocks that I'm hyping myself up with because I picked Amazon at $3.21 in 1997. These stocks, we still hold these stocks. And that's, that's such an important lesson. Maybe the most, I, the reason I ended with it is because that's the most important lesson I can think of. To close it out, we wanted to highlight one of our favorite lessons of all. In a world dominated by the short term, one of the biggest edges any of us can have in investing or in life is to play the long game. Our good friend, Ryan Kruger of Freedom Day Solutions explains why. Well, I'm working on this for a book. So you got that scoop first out of me, which is, is good. And, and it's, I, I, I'm trying to tell my kids and young investors, but the cool part is my 90 and we've now got five clients over a hundred. They would probably say the same thing. They're still playing the long game. They're, if you avoid an increasing supply of shortcuts, which are in front of us every day, you're all of a sudden, no matter what you're doing, investing included with the most easy and tangible to see results, you're already finding yourself on some pretty uncrowded paths. If you look for every long cut imaginable, and that's not easy. Instant gratification is a real deal. Um, deferred gratification isn't very popular. I don't even think it's a term, but, but if I have the choice and the ability to play the long game, um, I think what I've realized that I come to appreciate more with every passing day since I left Wall Street and started an RIA is this world of abundance where capitalism works because of competition and it's wonderful. It's the most pure, longest lasting system I know of. But to be a happy human being, live in a world of abundance and it is a small, beautiful world and how you treat people um, is a big part of this too. And I know I'm getting a little off the path of, of an investor only question, but I think they collide with each other. Um, so playing the long game, not just with your investments. And I think, and I said it earlier, it's easy to say, hang in there and play the long game. And by the way, notice I didn't say hang in there. I think anybody should fire their advisor or portfolio manager if they're ever told to hang in there. I think there has to be some cell discipline in life. If you're willing to play long game, you got to stop doing things that are not working and do more things that are working. Thank you again to all the guests who have come on the podcast and to all of our followers who have learned all of these lessons along with us. We look forward to getting some more great answers to these questions to share. With you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.